So what we started last week was using PouchDB to be able to save more data than just a, a simple name like our app currently does. We wanted to save, in our case, three bits of data. Uh, so you want to you get a copy of that from the network drive, my pouch DB, and the project at the moment has my pouch.html and then the pouch DB 306 JS library. Uh, so this is what allows us to write this um, JavaScript, which then converts it into the appropriate commands uh, in that it then saves database content. So I'm going to load up my pouch HTML in Notepad. And we've been running into some uh, speed bumps here and there, specifically about um, the web browser, it seems. So we're, you're gonna, you want to make sure you're running this in Chrome. It seems to work the, the most effectively in Chrome. And it's also got the debug tools that will allow us to actually look at the database um, without an extra plugin. So just so that we're all set up, make sure you open up that my pouch HTML file and then run it in, in, in Chrome. And then we'll see what we've got so far. All right, so remember, run this in Chrome. And uh, when we load it up, we've got some simple input boxes. Uh, the concept here is that I'm going to add this to our app in that we're going to give the users uh, a way to uh, save some notes for themselves, uh, to um, make a note of classes that they might have already taken or, or wish to take. Uh, so we'll be able to capture a CRN number for the class, a class title, and an instructor's name. Then we've got a simple clear button to, uh, to start over. Then we've got add class and show classes. So at the moment, if we don't do if we don't add anything and we click add classes, we get a simple error message. Obviously, it would be better if it tells us error. Please fill in your fields. That requires more uh, error checking within our code. So if I then go to show classes, we're not there yet. But if I do begin to fill in information, such as, okay, CRN number 1234, class Android <coughs> 1, and instructor campus, and then add class. I should uh, probably fix that misspelling there. Uh, then it'll say class added. Okay, you get some feedback that says it captured the data. The, where last we left off is we want to be able to click show classes to show me a simple table of all of the classes I've saved so far. What we can do before we get to that is make sure you're in Chrome. Then you want to right click anywhere, inspect element. This will load up the web development tools. And then switch over to the Resources tab. Not the sources, resources right there. So in Chrome, we can go over to the Resources tab. Opera has this also. Recently, recently in a year or so ago, uh, Opera decided to kind of scrap their whole engine and uh, go with the Google Chrome engine, which I personally didn't like that. I've been using the web browser uh, Chrome, uh, Opera for a long time, actually, since the 90s. And uh, they had their own uh, rendering engine and all this underlying technology that I thought was a good thing. It was good to have, like, uh, you know, third-party candidates. But they decided, in order to get more market share, I suppose, they went over with the Chrome engine. So Opera is very similar in that it's also got a built-in resource viewer and all of that. Firefox 
at the moment I don't believe has one. You have to add the Firebug plugin to get this. But what I want to do under resources here is on the left side, this will show you all of your cookies that are being saved, etc., uh, local storage, and indexed DB is the type of database that is being created internally via PouchDB. Um, there's pros and cons to use it, and there's another one called WebSQL, WebSQL. So if you're if you know more SQL commands, you can use that, and we can force uh, PouchDB to actually create databases that adhere to the web. SQL um, schema, but by default we've got IndexedDB. When you look there, then you've got a, uh, in mine it shows pouch check modern IDB. I don't know if everyone also has that. If you do or don't, don't worry. But below that I've got it that it says pouch SDCE classes. That's the database that we created. And then various ways to actually show the data. The quickest way is by sequence right here. And so far I've added one item and there's my data title of the class, instructor's name, ID, the CRN, and an internal revision number. So this is where we left off. We know it's working. It's capturing the data. I want to add some more data. Well, then we get into the issues about beta testing it. Let's say for some reason I also I want to add class 1, 2, 3, 4 again. But this is actually Android 2 with Smith add class error. Not a very friendly error, of course, but this is all about the user experience design, UX. We've mentioned that a few <laughs> times throughout the class, user experience. What is the experience of someone using your website, your app, whatever you're working with? And in this case, this is not a very good UX error. Well, what kind of error? There's no feedback that says that ID, that CRN number, has already been used. Again, all of this uh, error reporting and user experience doesn't happen automatically. It's all in the code, in the code that we write, in the error uh, testing that we do. Um, so at this point we're getting an error if we try to add the exact same CRN, but as soon as you change the CRN you are able to add the class and you can click refresh down here. We haven't looked at these yet, but you've got a refresh button to refresh what's in the database and actually you can clear out what's in the database by selecting one of these views and then clicking delete the database info. But anyway, if I refresh that, now I've got two items. So if you're using my files. This is what we've got so far. If you're using your own files, hopefully you've got something similar. But let's continue with where we were last week. We'll go back to Notepad. And so far, um, this is our code. We've got those buttons and input fields. No problem. I'm going to fix that spelling right there if you want to. Line 54. There's too many S's there. Add class. And then up at the top, we've got the various functions that capture the data and store it and database creation and everything. And then, of course, one of the most important things, line 5, is to reference the PouchDB JavaScript. When we get to into Eclipse and we update our project, we are going to need to remember to add that script. And then this stuff, we'll probably have it in an external file instead of just built into our main file. Question. Yeah, you had said um, either through Eclipse or maybe through another method. We, if we wrote a, a, an app using just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, mm -hmm. it would easily, there are methods that we could convert it to be an Android app or mm -hmm. Windows app. Or, when we're using the, these plugins of um, jQuery and jQuery Mobile mm -hmm. and Pouch, since they're ending in .js, these are JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So even though we're using these additional plugins, it's still the app that we created will still be easily convertible into the different platforms. Well, the short answer perhaps is yes, but the longer answer is that it you, you need to read the documentation of the particular library you're using. For example, PouchDB when I was using it with version 2x, it had a limitation in that in older Android devices it was very buggy. 
but perhaps now that they're in the 3x branch, they might have addressed that. So, yeah. So those are the things that might not work. Exactly. So this is why it's it's a challenge to design for all the platforms. I was just reading an article yesterday. Uh, there's been this um, iPhone app, I think it's called DJ or VDJ or something, something clever. And it's an iPhone app that was around for a couple of years where you can be your own DJ. you got a couple of turntables on the screen, you mix it, you're a little DJ. And they actually sort of got like favored nation status under Apple in that they were featured on the home page, they were featured on commercials, they were pre-installed on their devices in store. And now that company has branched out finally into Android because they also wanted to get a piece of the pie under Android. And the, what I read in that article was the developer was saying, I needed to hire three more guys just to work on the Android version because it's quirks and it's, um, for back up, lack of a better word, it's fragmentation in that there's so many types of Android devices. You know, I've got this 4.3 inch one, and then I know a couple of you in the class have the same device that you managed to get, and then some of you got tablets, seven inch, and some of you have Android 2.3 and some of you have Android 4.1, where it's a lot more homogenized on the iPhone in that Apple controls the hardware and the software. And then at some point they say, oh, you've got an iPhone 1.0, poor you. Here's an iPhone 6. So people still hang on to their Android devices for longer, perhaps. And so this developer talked about his uh, challenge in designing for all platforms. Ideally, you want to be on all platforms. You don't want to exclude possible revenue streams. But the actuality of it the reality is that it takes the time and the effort and the money to get it on all platforms. So something like what I'm trying to teach here will kind of get us in that direction, I think, easier. Because the guy was talking about, like, yeah, there's so many quirks in Android that I have to deal with C++ and Java. Where in iPhone, I just have to deal with Objective-C. And we're trying to do it here in HTML. There's going to be limitations, of course. But hopefully this gives us enough of a starting point to maybe help us decide what we want to do next. Question. Yes. So I have 4.1.2 Android and the 4.4.4. Uh huh. Uh, the map doesn't show on 4.4.4. Oh, interesting. It does on 4.4.4. Uh, we'll have to. What? On 4.4.4. That's what beta testing is all about. Yes. So in the Android world, uh, how possible is it for people to upgrade their operating system? What's required? Is it required support from the manufacturer of the device? Or what's from the carrier, mostly, it seems. If you've got AT&T, and you know, this LG 730 was hot two years ago or whatever, but now there's hotter ones. There's the LG 830. I don't know. There's newer things. So it's a lot up to the manufacturer. These devices should be able to handle you know, doing the upgrades, but it's the carriers that they want to sell you another two-year contract for the device rather than upgrade. This one is stuck at 4.1, I think, but I think I've read that people can, uh, you know, jailbreak it and all of that and, and upgrade it to 4.4.4, but it's the carriers that are kind of holding us back because they want you to buy new devices. Sounds to me like it, indeed that is the uh, case, and so I don't know if, uh, if the statement about how long people keep their Android devices is necessarily as much of a factor as you, know, you buy whatever is off the shelf and you know if what's on the shelf is a 2.2 then that's what you end up getting. True, but what's on the shelf doesn't last as long. You're not you're probably not going to find an Android 2.x device off the shelf right now. If you maybe go really hunting for it on Amazon or eBay and such, you could probably get it. If you walk into any you know Verizon store, uh, uh, AT&T store, or Target or Best Buy, you're usually going to get a four point X device, but it, it's everyone's got a different experience, and that's our challenge with with Android in that you can have that fragmentation. Uh, one of the funniest quotes I, I read about that, of course, from an Apple person, was something like, "Yeah, Android, yeah, they're the they're the the, the toxic hell stew of um, of of, of, uh, of mobile." And obviously, that's obviously super hyperbole, but it's just funny to see how each of the companies talk about each other. But uh, I digress. Question there. D did you have another one? Oh, well, I was just going to say, so if you were trying to write an app for multiple platforms, do, do, do most developers, instead of trying to take one um, HTML file and 
make it work with all the devices. So they just create like one app that's for Windows and a completely different app. It does the same thing, but it's written just for Apple. I, from what I've seen, I uh, I need more data to kind of see uh, how people are doing it via the HTML route. But the non-HTML route, which is still the most popular, is what I see that, that uh, a company makes their app for a platform and then kind of tweaks it for the other platforms, but not enough to have the look and feel of the other device. I definitely see that because my main phone is a Windows phone, and that's got its whole aesthetic navigating through the screens usually is a cool little flip and I see right away well this used to be an Android because it doesn't flip it slides because maybe an Android device slides by default so the shortcut of that is a developer you know porting it to different devices and it and it's just it, it works but it doesn't have that aesthetic and people that use the device and, and adhere to it they see those little details and maybe ding it one star on the on the App Store because you're trying but not enough so then when you're dealing with um, with the with the mobile device uh, with the apps the way we're doing it for mobile devices, well, uh, we've got this core HTML project which can then be styled via the CSS and the animations changed via CSS and such and jQuery Mobile, so perhaps it gives you a little bit more uh, of a head start to try to customize it per device. So we're right we're focusing on on Android at the moment and we'll make it look great there, but you'll have to tweak it to make it look great on, on iPhone. You know, their aesthetic after they went to iOS 8 or 7, I think, they got into the flat design, which is sort of what you're kind of seeing on the latest Android, but still with their own flair. And then the the Windows phone, their style is completely different in that it's all flat squares and, and it's got its own style. So on this project here, we're working on creating this database just in HTML. This could work as a simple web page itself. And we're going to uh, put it into our project as an Android um, app. So let's see here. Uh, here's what the last thing that we were working on. Show classes. Line 55, when you click the show classes, it'll run the show classes function. And we started to write it up here on line 35. This is where we got so far. We've got a method on line 36, a, a command that says all docs. Show me all docs that are in this database, db. And remember, that was created way up here when we created a variable called db and we created a new instance of pouch db, stce class. So then we can apply various methods to that database. What are those methods? They're all on pouchdb.com. Put something into the database, right there, db.put. Um, that requires an ID. We've also got db. Dot, um, there's put, and what's the other one? Push, I think. That one puts something into the database. What's that? No? Post, OK. There's put and post. And post allows you to put data in it without putting a unique ID. It makes one up for you. Those, those are the methods, those are the commands that you can do that PouchDB defines. So the latest method that we're working with right here is under Show Classes. Give me all the docs. And remember, we kind of broke it up for readability, but this is all one statement. From here to here, which could be one line, but we've broken it up because we're doing several things. First of all, we've got one thing, comma, and then another thing, and then the end of that uh, statement. The first thing we've said here is we want a couple of uh, options. Show me the documents, but in these ways. Include all documents? True. Yes, yeah, show me everything that's in the database. That's got its comma. Ascending? True. Show it to me ascending. Lowest number to highest number. The default is that we're going to show our data via the ID. And up here we define that a class has three fields. ID, underscore ID, that's the one that's required that way, underscore ID. And we're filling it with whatever the variable of class CRN is, which we get from clicking on get class from the input box CRN field, comma, a title of the class, which we get from the field, and then an instructor from the field. So here we're saying 
sort this ascending via ID. So whatever we put into class CRN will be in order. So if, if it's in numbers, class 1, 2, 3 will appear before class 1, 2, 5, even if you add class 1, 2, 5 first. And then um, it'll also put it in order if you put letters into the CRN number, and we'll see how that works. Uh, but that's the first uh, parameter in the DB all documents, all docs. The second one is a callback function. What do you do with it? And we've got an error, and we've got, a, and we've got the, the, the positive result. We didn't do any error correction here, any error checking. We don't have any if-else, like, is there actually data? Is the data malformed? All of that stuff. Obviously, we should be doing that, but um, that's what the beta testing is to help us to figure out what we want to do. And then we've got show table of classes, doc dot rows. Show me each row of the data that we get out of querying the database. So now we need to define the function show table of classes. This is the one that's going to be a little tricky, and we really need to watch our, our opening and closing curly braces and all of that, because we're about to build a table. So a table in HTML is basically you know, rows and columns. This whole thing is a table. Then we've got a row, the first row, the second row, the third row, first column, second column. And um, you see that, of course, in like Excel. It's just rows and columns. It's a table. In HTML, we have to create the table tag at the beginning, and then the slash table at the end. But then we also have to define each row and each cell. So each particular table row is going to be a TR. Stuff inside, and then slash TR, table row. And then each particular cell it's table data, so that'll be a TD. Stuff inside, slash TD. Up here, the stuff inside will be the, the table data itself. So a row could have two cells, or three cells, or 3,000 cells. So we can get kind of complicated, because we're going to see TR, open close, and then another and then a TD for the first table data cell, and another TD for the second table cell, and another and another. And then that closes that TR, and then another table row with another table data, another table data. Closes the TR. And then another table row. And we build it up like that. So designing one in HTML wouldn't be that complicated, but we're going to be complicated here because we need to pull out each bit of data from the database. One a class variable holds three things, uh, CRN, instructor, and class name. So actually we would be using here uh, three columns. Column one, column two, column three. CRN, <coughs> class name, instructor. Here we need to build it row by row. I kind of think about it in the, did you ever see the movie Tron? 1982 classic movie where Jeff uh, Bridges gets zapped by the digitizer and row by row he's digitized. I remember that part. And then he's recreated in the digital world. And then at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, he gets back to the real world and then he gets re-digitized or undigitized row by row. That's kind of what we have to do here. Row by row we have to build this table because each row is going to have a different class. All right, so let's write some code here. Um, line 35 to 41 is our, is our show classes function, so make sure after line 41, give yourself a couple of spaces to line 43, and here we will define the function show table of classes. Remember to spell it the same. You can check if you did by highlighting it. 
and it highlights everywhere else. If you spelled it wrong and you highlight it, it won't highlight in the other part. Not open, close, parentheses, open, close, curly brace, semicolon. Notice up here, line uh, 41, we're saying call or run the show table of classes function with this data, doc.rows. And that comes from querying the database. Give me all the docs. So it's going to give us our first document, our first class, and feed it into table of classes. So when we're defining the function, we need to have a variable in here to say, you know, here's a basket to hold that data that you're passing into this function. You can call it anything. We'll just call it data. Class data. We're going to repurpose the uh, this message div that's right here. Right, This is the one that tells us a class added or error and such. We're going to repurpose that and build a table in that div. So inside of the function we need to make a reference to that uh, to that div so we can add stuff to it. So inside here we'll create a variable. We'll call it div. And what we'll do is we'll fill it with the name of that div on screen which is document get element by ID Inside of the get element by ID in quotes, we're going to specify which one. And remember, we named that div message. So basically, we're putting that div, its contents, into this variable. And then we can uh, replace the contents of the div dynamically. It'll happen behind the scenes, but every class, we're going to then put it into the div, one row at a time. Question? Can, can we call it the result? Uh, the result, yes, very good, thank you. So actually we want to call that the result. The capital R. The result. Not yet, we will be doing that, but right now all that we want, all that we want to do is start to this sort of allows us to pay attention to an element on screen. Then on the next steps, we're then going to edit what's in the element with inner HTML. We have, a, we have a bit of things to do first. Next line. We are going to build another, <clears throat> we're going to create another variable, and this is going to hold each row at a time. So we'll call this row of uh, r. And we'll call it just str uh, for string equals. This is going to hold one row at a time. <laughs> and then in, in quotes, what's that? You don't have to necessarily have anything. Not, not have anything? You don't have String? Uh, no, not really, but it's it's good practice because we're, we want to create it so that we can use it. So here, this is going to be a string. And inner HTML works um, in that it lets us write HTML, right? So we can write the tags. Uh, so inside of these quotes, we're going to write some HTML and then that'll get processed and displayed properly on screen. So we're going to start with the table tag. But we're not going to close the table here. We're going to close it later because we're going to need to build it row by row. Table tag inside of the table tag we, we can do a few uh, parameters because the table could be visible or invisible. 
in the old days, you know, the ancient times five years ago of web design, a lot of people used tables to develop a website because you could divide a table in that on the left uh, cell is going to be my sidebar and on the right cell is going to be my content. Well, that's very passe and not standards compliant. Um, we're going to use a table for the purpose of actually displaying tabular data. But it could be um, an invisible table unless we say a table border equals single quotes one. Let's say give us a one pixel size table. The borders are going to be one pixel around the edge. Now, of course, here be careful. These are single quotes because we've got the double quotes around the whole statement. I'm going to break this into the next line and tab it a little bit, three times. Because HTML doesn't care. It could be one long line, but it's going to be hard to read and debug unless we do something like this. Next, we're going to write the tr tag. And then we'll close the tr tag. So the first row, we're setting up our first row here, and what I want to display on top here is um, the class, the CRM. So I, I mentioned we have TDs, table data, each, each particular cell. But the very first cell at the top is a special one, because think about, you've, you've got a table you know, with a bunch of rows. Isn't the first row usually special? Maybe bold, and it's the, it's the heading of that, so you can tell what columns you have. So we're going to find these up here. These are going to be th tags, table heading. table heading. TH, not HT. I can't erase it. TH. Right here. We're going to write the TH tag. Close the TH tag. And the very first table heading is going to be CRM. That's what's going to be shown on the first table heading. The first column. The first column will display CRM numbers. On the next line, now here's the part where we then have to step through the database and get key number one, number two, number three, number 99. We have to go through them all. And if we know at the moment we've got three classes in our database, well, we'll just tell it to display those three. But we'll always be able to add to the database. So actually, we need a way to step through however many number of records we have in the database. And for that, we will use the for statement, F-O-R. That'll be that for every one of these, do something. For these three, do that. For those four, do this. Question? We will, but we want to do that based on the um, 
based on knowing how many we have, uh, which we have three, so we'll write those three. We've got CRN at the moment, we'll need title and instructor. So let's do those actually. Uh, so within still the same row, we've got a TH for CRN. We'll write another TH for class. So notice here, we've got a uh, one row, and we've got the first column, TH, CRN, the second column, TH, class, and another TH, that will be instructor. So here will be instructor. So you can double check your opening and closing tags because we we'll, we will get pretty weird results if we if we're not opening and closing all of these. Remember, always click on a tag and make sure you see its pair. So we've created here our first row, and now we're going to start to fill in every row below it. Class 1, 2, 3, and then class 1, 2, 5, and then class 2, 9, 9, etc. That's where we're going to use our for statement. That's where we can uh, go from uh, record to record. So we're going to create a for statement here, open close parentheses, and then open and close curly brace. So we're Say that again? Yes, it's closed right there. Okay. Let me zoom out. Yes, so we want to close the, the very first row, the string right there. Okay, the way for works is that we will be able to step through a sequence uh, of, of information. Uh, so we haven't done this one before, and there's a very specific syntax to it in that you have to tell it uh, what um, variable are we going to use, uh, how many times, and how to step through, how to increment. So we'll write it and then I'll explain it. So inside of the for, we're going to write var. We're creating a variable within the for statement. And then traditionally, we use i. I believe it stands for increment, or interval, or integer, or something. But traditionally, we use i. And then we'll set that to 0. We'll start off on the 0th um, position. Computers, and in computer science, we usually start counting from 0. 0 is the first unit. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? That's four items. 0, 1, 2, 3 is four items. So we're going to start with the zeroth position uh, and then a semicolon here. Usually we only see the semicolon at the end of a complete statement, but this one's a little weird. This is how this is. We we'll end it right here because we're saying this is our first sort of parameter inside of four. We're going to start with the zeroth position. And then, well, how many times are we going to do this? As I said, if we knew that we had to do this five times, we would then do i less than uh, 4. So that would do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, actually. So then that would do that exact amount. But we don't know how many we have. So actually, we'll do i less than data dot length. Semicolon. So again, I can easily think if I've got 10 things, I'll just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10. But with computers, we have to think about this way what's greater than, what's less than, you can even do equal to, or you can do less than or equal to, and such. 
And here we're saying, uh, keep doing this as long as we've got uh, records in the database. So dot length is a way, is a, is a method to check how many things are there in something. Usually this relates to a database or an array. How many things are there in something? And the something is data, which we're getting up here, which comes from querying the database. So here, this will go through 5 records, 50 records, 5,000 records. And we want to look at each one, each one at a time. That's the increment. We could look at the first one, and then the third one, and then the next third one, etc. But usually we want to go the first one, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. And a shorthand for that, which is customary, is to do I++. plus plus. Plus plus is simply to increment something one unit. Uh, so if we started on the zeroth unit, is zero, let's say we got five items in the database, is zero less than five? Yes, so we do it. And then we increment i1. So now it becomes i is one. Is one less than five? Yes. Yes, so we do it again. Then we add one to it. Now it's a two. Is two less than five? Yes. yes. Three less than five? Yes. It's four. Yes. Is five less than five? No. No, five is equal to five. So we've run out of, um, of items in the database. Five is not less than five, so then this stops. The for statement just stops. No more. As long as we are less than our length, we will do it again and again and again in a split second, in the speed of our processor, right, to uh, billion hertz. Um, so this is our for statement. It'll do it as many times as necessary because of length. It will, it'll do what? Everything we'll have here. Let's go inside the for statement. And what we will do every time is we will add to this string. Right now the string is made up of this one line of code, and we want to add to it the next row. So we will say string str plus equals. You haven't seen that one before. That one is, uh, if when we have equals, this replaces whatever is on the right side, dump out whatever's on the inside or the left side and replace it. Plus equals is we've seen plus before. We're adding to something, concatenation. We're adding whatever's already there, we add to it what follows. So plus equals. In quotes, double quotes. The TR tag, but we don't close it. And the TD tag, but we don't close it. Because we're starting to build one row and specifically one piece of data. The data that's coming is the CRN number, one, two, three. Plus data. And now we'll see square brackets. We haven't seen these before. I'll explain that in a moment. Data square brackets, and inside square brackets we'll put I. dot doc dot underscore id. Again, this database could have 10 records or one record. And right here, well, we want the very first record from the data in the database. Show me the first value. Well, i, we defined up here, which is 0, which is the first value in the database. Go to the first record in the database, specifically the ID of the first document and show it on screen inside of this TD, inside of this row. Plus 
plus because we have three things that we're going to be doing over and over. First row of the first cell, the second cell, the third cell. Over and over and over. So we're still building the first the first one here. This TR is building this first row. And this TD is building the first cell. So this next line that we're going to add is going to build then the second table data. So I'm going to actually push it to the next line, press enter, double quotes. Here is where we will close TD. So the TD opens, TD closes, and it's full of this data, the ID, the CRN number. And when we close one table data right afterwards, still within the quotes, we will open another TD. So that we can display the second bit of data after those quotes, plus, same thing as above up here, data i, dot doc, but this time, give me the data that's inside of title, which is the title of the class, plus. Next line, we've got the double quotes again. We need to basically do what we had up there, close that TD. That's closing the second cell. Start a new cell. Oops, like that. So that cell is closed, it's going to display the title of the class. Another cell to display the instructor's name. Plus data i dot doc dot inst. Right, that's what we called it. Let's just double check. So it looks like it's separate. I just mentioned it's INST. INST, yes. Another plus. Well, if we open this uh, table data, this cell, to display the instructor's name, then we need to close it. And then we need to close the row that we opened way up here. Next line. So double quotes again, close that TD, and then close that TR, the one up there. And this defines one whole row of one record. So this will do it for the zeroth uh, record because we have zero. And then uh, so zero is less than five. We do it one more time. That becomes a one. 1 is less than 5, so do it again. So then that'll be data 1, which will be the second item. Data 1, its ID. Data 1, its title. Data 1, its instructor. Increments. Goes to 2. 2 is less than 5. So then it'll do data 2, which is the third item. Display it, etc. Over and over and over. This is what computers are made for, to do repetitive, redundant tasks. Once you set up the algorithm, and if it works, you just let it go, and it'll do that tedious stuff that would be very annoying to do by hand. Of course, setting up the algorithm, which is the technique to 
accomplish the task, that can often be the hard part. Perhaps you've written all your, all your code correctly, no syntax errors, but you have that logic error. Remember syntax errors and logic errors? Logic errors, I think, can be a lot harder to fix because you have to figure out, what did I do wrong? I wrote everything right, but what did I do wrong? What was my logic error? All right, so this whole for statement was to then display the data of one class. We still need to finish some stuff up here because at the top here we said create a table. So after the curly brace, which in my case is 52, this curly brace here finishes your, your for statement. Yes? May I suggest if you have a semicolon at the end of your next statement? Say that again, please. A semicolon at the end of the statement might not be. Here? No. Above the line. You have oh, here. concatenated a whole bunch of strings, you should have a semicolon at the end of the statement. Uh, yes. Let's try that. So line 51, because that is all of the string, yes. We started the string, etc., etc. We forgot to end it. But we'd probably be okay because we've got the ending over here. But just to be safe, that's a semicolon right there because that ended that whole one big statement that we broke into three, four lines. And now this semicolon, this curly brace, which is the whole for statement, Let's uh, press enter there. That gives us line 53. We want to close that whole table we created a moment ago, a while ago. So we'll say again, um, str plus equals, because we're going to keep adding to this string, this whole line of code, plus equals, and then double quotes, and we will finish the table, slash table. See how that highlights up there. We finish the whole table. Semicolon. So that's that's the that's the scene in Tron right there. Row by row, we're building this. And then finally, display it on screen. Next line, we'll say div dot inner HTML equals string. Div, back at the top there, that holds that, uh, that, that, the result. Technically, we didn't need to do that. We could have, at this point, written document dot get element by ID the result equals string or uh, dot inner HTML equals string. That would work also, but uh, this is another way to do it. So after all of this work, hopefully we don't have any errors. Hopefully I don't have any errors. I'm going to save that, run it in Chrome. I know I've got data in my database, but I will add one more record just for fun. I'll add a, a CRN that has letters, ABC. Add class. Show class. All right. Did it show you a table? Raise your hand if it worked. Good. So, perfect time to take a break if it didn't. We'll do 10 minutes. We'll be back at 7.05.